Hi, my name is Morgan Patelka. I am a professor of history and Asian studies uh, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a wonderful object uh, from the Asia Society uh, Rockefeller Collection, uh, a ceramic from Japan made in the Oribe style in the late 16th or early 17th century. Uh, and this object uh, I'm going to situate against a larger history of ceramics in Japan and in terms of uh, the effect of the tea ceremony, uh, the, the spread of the tea ceremony, the diversification in consumer needs that the tea ceremony caused on ceramic production, which I will argue led to this really amazing and innovative Oribe style of ceramics uh, emerging and becoming a really important part of the, the broad uh, and really uh, unique and interesting range of ceramic styles in Japan during the early modern period. Uh, so the object in question you see here on the screen, and uh, it is a beautiful piece. Uh, it is described as a square serving dish with a bale handle. Um, this is, as you can see, uh, a hand-built uh, stoneware ceramic. Uh, what that means is that the, the potter who made this uh, made it out of uh, rolled out slabs of clay uh, that have uh, the right kind of body that they can be fired to uh, higher than 1000 degrees centigrade. Uh, ceramics above 1000 degrees centigrade are considered high fire or high, high temperature wares. Those below 1000 degrees centigrade are, are low fire or low temperature ceramics. And you can tell the difference if you tap the ceramic with your finger, the higher fired ceramics will ring because they are uh, in a different molecular formation than those that have been fired to a lower temperature, which produce a kind of thud. Uh, higher fire ceramics are uh, stronger, more resilient, they conduct temperature better, uh, and you can produce more interesting effects with glazes uh, when ceramics are fired to higher temperatures. Uh, and indeed, it is the glaze and design uh, of this dish that I think are really um, quite remarkable. Uh, as you can see, there's a mixture of elements here. Um, so the clay body itself is uh, a kind of bone color. And uh, in order to create a canvas for the designs to be more legible, the potter applied a white slip, which is a um, kind of liquid clay where you take a white clay body, a pure white clay body, and you mix it with water essentially and, and brush it on uh, like you're painting the ceramic. And that gives you uh, a, a white canvas on which to create other designs. Um, then uh, a, a, uh, an iron-based um, compound was brushed on to produce those brown uh, designs, uh, a kind of fence design on one side of the dish, uh, these interconnected uh, circles uh, in the middle of the dish, and then uh, horizontal lines on the other side of the dish, which I'll show you later. Uh, and then in a very typical fashion for this style of ceramic, uh, two corners are glazed uh, with a thick uh, copper bearing glaze that produces this lustrous green color. Uh, and that same glaze has also been applied to the handle. Uh, this image shows us the dish from above, uh, and you can see that although the uh, piece is, is, as I said, handmade and uh, bears the uh, slight asymmetry that's really typical of a lot of Japanese ceramics that are handmade and that, in a sense, celebrate their, their naturalness, uh, the imprint of the potter's hand, uh, the overall shape is relatively symmetrical with the, the dish itself uh, being a basic square uh, bisected perfectly by the handle. Um, you may notice on the upper right and the lower left that the handle splits as it connects 
to the corner of the dish, creating a small opening. Uh, and that's the kind of detail that, that consumers, that users of uh, the dish would have remarked on and really appreciated. Um, and you can see that the design has elements that seem to come from the natural world and yet at the same time is really quite abstract. And that's a hallmark of the new ceramic designs that emerge in the early 17th century and, and becomes a really important characteristic of certain styles of Japanese ceramics throughout the early modern and into the modern period. I'll talk more about that later. Now, now if you look at this image showing us the base of the dish, uh, you can see that it has four feet uh, that allow it to sit comfortably on uh, a table or on a tray or even on a tatami mat on the floor. Um, the, the, you might think the bottom of the pot is the least interesting part. Why are you showing us this, Patelka? Uh, well, the reason is that you always want to look at the bottom of a ceramic because you often can learn about how that piece was made. So on the lower left corner of uh, the dish here, you can see the exposed clay body. And we can see that it very clearly is a, a gray kind of bone color and that the slip uh, that gives the piece its white uh, kind of underground uh, behind the, the, the design or decoration uh, foundation uh, is, is visible here. Uh, and you can even see the brush strokes as the potter rather hastily, uh, still deliberately, but rather hastily brushed some slip on the bottom but didn't cover the entire piece. Um, you can also see the way the, the copper glaze, uh, the green glaze uh, from the corners has run and pooled in really distinctive ways around the foot, uh, particularly on the upper left corner. Uh, and it's, it's that balance between the deliberate intentionality of the potter who applies certain elements of the design very carefully with a brush or through uh, manipulation of the clay and, and the, the, the accidents that occur in the atmosphere of the kiln uh, when, a, when an enormous Mino kiln full of ceramics, thousands of ceramics would have been fired to a very high temperature and all kinds of things happen that are unexpected. It's that mixture of the, the, the plan of the potter and the natural, um, uh, atmosphere and environment of the kiln that makes ceramics so special. Um, here is the dish from a different angle, uh, showing you the curvature of the handle, um, which, which again, I would, I would you know, point out is really not perfectly symmetrical, not perfectly smooth, and in some ways almost bears the marks of the fingers of the potter in the, the shape uh, the kind of bumpy shape, especially visible along the bottom edge of the handle. And I think to consumers in 17th century Japan, that wouldn't have been seen as um, uh, a demerit, but as a positive attribute. Um, those quirky characteristics uh, were appreciated uh, by consumers of ceramics. Uh, and you can also see the horizontal uh, stripes on this side of uh, the dish, on the outer, the exterior edge, uh, with a kind of wavy line through them, looking uh, perhaps like some kind of a fence uh, or just an abstract design. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this uh, style of ceramics in Japan, because it is an extremely significant and noble heritage that makes the story of this individual piece, I think, even more interesting. So this dish was made in the Seto and Mino tradition. Uh, and this is a tradition that is named after the Seto and Mino region, uh, or really, I should say, neighboring regions of central Honshu, the main island of Japan, uh, close to the city that we, uh, that we now know as Nagoya. Um, this is modern day Aichi and Gifu prefectures. Uh, and this, this area is home to the longest continuous tradition of high fire or high temperature glazed ceramic production in Japan. And I wanna tell you just a little bit about that tradition to contextualize what is so special about the emergence of Oribe uh, as a style in the 17th century. Now, Seto and Mino ceramics emerged in the late 
Heian period around the 12th, the very end of the 12th century uh, and became a mainstay of domestically produced ceramics in Japan. Um, Japan has robust ceramic traditions all throughout its history, all across the archipelago, many, many kilns, many, many styles. But the dominant characteristic of Japanese ceramics in the pre-modern era, especially before the 16th century, is that they were highly influenced by imported Chinese ceramics. Uh, and most imported Chinese ceramics were beautifully glazed. Uh, there are many uh, ceramic traditions, of course, in China, some of which were patronized by the imperial court. Uh, and the, the complex uh, technologies of glazing and firing ceramics and creating incised uh, decorations on the surface of ceramics was uh, very influential in Japan. Um, and in the top row of the image you see on the screen, horizontally, are three Chinese ceramics made between the 12th and the 13th centuries that were imported to Japan from China. And then on the bottom row, you see three very similar ceramics that were made in Seto that attempted to reproduce the Chinese designs. Um, I'm using the word reproduce here to honor the Japanese term utsus or utsushi, which is often used when talking about uh, ceramic copies. The word copy in English is so tainted by our love of the original and disgust for um, reiteration in, in uh, the kind of post-Enlightenment era understanding of art. Um, but in, in the Japanese context, in the pre-modern era, especially um, reproducing styles and even reproducing particular objects was a really central and uh, highly valued way of making new objects. So these are not seen as derivative copies, but as respectful reproductions. Um, and there are many, many objects like these three objects that you see on the bottom. These are just samples from a, a Japanese catalog to show the influence uh, of Chinese ceramics on the Seto ceramic tradition. Now, as time goes on in the medieval period in Japan, um, the, the practice of drinking tea uh, is also imported from China as part of a larger complex of uh, technologies and uh, social structures and cultural beliefs that are very influential among the elites in Japan. Uh, and the objects that you see on now the right side of the screen in this right hand column are all made in China between the 12th and 14th centuries. So uh, mostly during the Song Dynasty and then imported to Japan where again, potters in the Seto region very assiduously reproduce the styles uh, and create objects that are, that are quite similar um, res respectful imitations, but don't have the same technology. Often there isn't an understanding of how the glazes are really made, what the effects are in the kiln to produce these remarkable results uh, of the Chinese wares. Uh, and, and in Japan and broadly today, um, the, the seto uh, reproductions are not seen as uh, being as high quality or as um, kind of marvelous in their creation of these lustrous effects on the uh, genware, the, the, the black glazed uh, Song Dynasty tea bowl on the right, for example. The Japanese potters uh, in the uh, 15th century, the early 16th century, were not able to achieve those same effects. But again, um, tea changed the styles of objects that were being made in Japan. Um, and led to new forms and new glazing techniques, but um, respectful imitation rather than, than real accurate copying is what is occurring here. Now, over the course of the 16th century, the culture of tea, uh, and I'm referring here both to the practice of drinking tea just on a daily basis, as well as the more ritualized uh, tea ceremony, uh, the, the, the culture of holding tea gatherings, uh, and following the choreographed procedures of preparing tea and serving tea to your guests um, became increasingly popular with elites, um, especially uh, upper level uh, warriors, the so-called daimyo or warlords of the 16th century, um, Buddhist priests, uh, aristocrats, uh, and also wealthy commoners, especially of the cities uh, of 16th century Japan. Uh, and as more people wanted to take part in this 
you know, rich, uh, meaningful culture of, of tea, uh, the demand for tea uh, ceramics increased. Uh, and there was this amazing diversification of the types of objects that tea practitioners started using in their gatherings. So for example, uh, a, a bowl made in Korea during the Joseon dynasty, perhaps made for tea, but perhaps made for um, as tableware, you know, to eat rice out of or some other food out of, was imported into Japan and became very much in demand, uh, highly sought after. And eventually, um, Korean potters were actually kidnapped during the uh, Imjin War of the late 16th century and forced to come back to Japan with uh, warlords as they retreated from the Korean Peninsula and established uh, ceramic production sites in various uh, provinces in uh, Western and Southern Japan. Uh, and the tea bowl on the right uh, made in Karatsu in the early 17th century in Kyushu uh, is an example of, of such a, a piece. So very much in the same style as the Joseon dynasty wears and made by a Korean potter, but living in Japan in a Japanese context. So this is just one very small sample of a much larger kind of flowering of ceramics uh, as a result of the, the spread and popularization of tea culture. Um, now this happened all over Japan, but the real centers uh, of activity were the cities of Kyoto, uh, the old imperial capital, uh, at this point in time, the largest city in Japan, and Sakai, which is a small port city near present-day Osaka that was the main trading hub for exchange with China. So merchants who were uh, sailing to China or um, Buddhist embassies, uh, pilgrimages that were going to China to visit um, holy centers there would come back through Sakai. There were whole warehouses dedicated to storing all different kinds of goods that were brought back from China. And as a result, both Kyoto and Sakai had the wealth, but also the cultural capital to become centers of tea activity. And this is also why Kyoto uh, and to a lesser extent Sakai um, are places where we find a startling diversity of new ceramics appearing in the last two decades of the 16th century and then continuing with this kind of explosion of ceramic innovation in the early 17th century. Uh, and this image here that you see um, is a tiny sample of uh, shards of, of fragments of whole ceramics that were dug up in excavations of consumer sites in Kyoto from the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, and, and they're beautiful, uh, even though most of these pieces are of course broken. And it is in this context that the Seto and Mino kilns, which as I said earlier, had existed since the late Heian period, the late 12th century, um, evolved new styles uh, to suit the demands of these uh, innovative and well-off tea practitioners in Kyoto and Sakai who were not always able to buy the imported Chinese ceramics, the antique wares, uh, and instead seemed to want objects that worked in the idiom in the style of glazing and decorating perhaps that you might see on imported Chinese wares, but that also were playful and that represented something new, uh, something distinctive and unique. Uh, this is the moment when tea culture in Japan and ceramic culture in Japan really changes uh, and, and becomes something new and distinctive. So on the right, on the right column, we see two styles that emerge in uh, the Seto and Mino kilns in this period. Here on the top, we see what's called yellow Seto. Uh, this is a, a serving dish uh, that has uh, a Chinese character written in the middle and splashes of a green coppery glaze. On the bottom, we see a black Seto tea bowl, uh, a really distinctive style that is, that is clearly related to the Fujian produced uh, Temmoku black glazed and brown glazed tea bowls that were imported from China earlier, but is now um, working in a completely different shape and with a, um, a boldness and a kind of um, love of the asymmetrical that, that is not found in the Chinese ceramic tradition. Here in the middle column, we see the Shino style. On the top, we see what is called gray Shino or Nezumi Shino, um, uh, a really bold and beautiful uh, way of 
of uh, creating this gray, uh, excuse me, gray and white contrasting uh, glaze and designs uh, on uh, asymmetrically shaped tea bowls. On the bottom, we see a Shino water container, um, again, with these um, uh, designs that are clearly from nature. These look like uh, reeds, uh, maybe growing behind a fence, but also are, are so abstract that they almost uh, could be, um, you know, uh, non-realistic designs uh, and, and are, are, are characteristic of Shino wares. Finally, on the left column, we see two examples of this new, very bold style of ceramics called Oribe uh, that is one of the most distinctive uh, styles of ceramics to emerge in Japan. On the top, we see a covered box. Uh, and one of the really innovative things about Oribe is that the shapes uh, included not only tea bowls, uh, water containers, and, and uh, in other words, objects meant for use in the tea ceremony itself, but also uh, ceramics that could be used for um, everyday life, for tableware, as tableware, uh, or in various ritual contexts. So uh, Oribe um, does include tea bowls, like the tea bowl that you see uh, on the bottom in the left column, but also other shapes, as we will see. So here is a really well-known, um, beautiful uh, black Oribe tea bowl. Um, uh, it's, it's described as being deep uh, because it is taller than it is wide. Uh, a tea bowl like this might very well be used uh, in the winter months when the uh, cylindrical shape would help to keep in the warmth of the tea, uh, prevent it from cooling down too rapidly so that it could be um, drunk by one uh, guest at a tea ceremony, or if it was a thick tea ceremony, actually passed from guest to guest uh, without losing its temperature. Um, part of what's so innovative and kind of startling about this tea bowl is the way that it combines uh, this thick, lustrous black glaze uh, on the lip of the bowl uh, with this very bold design uh, where a, um, a, a black or kind of purple uh, glaze has been applied over a white slip, and then on top of that white slip is a brushed on design of what perhaps is a flower. Um, and the shape, uh, which is thrown on a wheel, but then altered by the potter after, uh, after pulling it off, uh, is uh, asymmetrical in the quirky kind of way that tea consumers seem to really have preferred at this moment. Um, here we have a um, shoe-shaped uh, Oribe tea bowl. Uh, these are a really interesting design um, in which you have this radical uh, asymmetrical uh, rim uh, or lip that, that is like a wandering mountain path that doesn't even pretend to just be a symmetrical circle. Um, you have this really interesting uh, design of, a, of some kind of a vine uh, in the black glaze uh, with a white slip um, showing through where the black glaze has probably been scraped away to reveal the design. And then as you can see, the foot and the base of the tea bowl is left unglazed so that the tea practitioner can feel the clay uh, and look at the contrast between the glazed portion of the tea bowl and the exposed clay. That's something that tea practitioners really appreciated. Oribe also includes these wonderful uh, serving dishes, uh, many of which, of course, have, as we've already seen, these beautiful handles uh, that sometimes imitate um, the kind of warp of wood. Uh, sometimes they uh, remind uh, us of bamboo. Uh, other times they seem to be imitating other materials. Um, but the, the contrast between the corners that are glazed with this uh, coppery glaze uh, that's semi-translucent, which also covers the handle, and then the highly decorated and designed uh, central area of the dish. Uh, and in the case of this particular dish that we see on the screen, we have these wheels um, that are um, perhaps alluding to wagon wheels or to the wheel of the Buddhist law with a kind of abstract fence design uh, in the center of the dish. Uh, and, and if you take a step back, you also notice that the dish itself is in a really interesting uh, sort of slightly symmetrical uh, design that almost has um, a fence-like shape to it as well. Uh, here we have a 
um, a, a remarkable fan-shaped dish that has the, the lustrous green coppery glaze on the upper or left part of the piece uh, as we're looking at it in this image, and then has uh, the, the uh, white slip uh, base with the um, design, the kind of coppery uh, brushed on design of the wheel, uh, birds, and what look like waves on the interior and exterior of the, um, I wouldn't say unglazed uh, part of the piece, but the part of the piece that is not glazed with the green copper glaze. Um, this, this piece has seen some wear and tear, and you can see that the copper glaze has worn off of the handle in some places. Uh, but the, the overall design, the overall aesthetic is just so unusual uh, and, and, and really represents something new. Uh, and that brings us finally back to this wonderful square serving dish with the bale handle uh, from the, the collection of the Asia Society. Um, and I've chosen to show you different angles of the piece. Uh, each time I show you an image of it, um, the Asia Society website has a really wonderful um, feature where you can look at this piece in 360 degrees by turning it around or by watching a, an animated uh, rotation of, of the dish. Uh, and I think you can see the characteristics of this piece now in a new light, having heard about the history of Seto and Mino ceramics uh, and their, um, in some ways, almost slavish attention to the styles of ceramics being imported from China. They're not always completely successful attempts to reproduce those styles. And then the way that the 16th century uh, kind of eruption of tea culture and its popularity among the elites who served as the patrons of the Seto and Mino kilns opened up this new space for potters and tea practitioners to collaborate in the creation of wares that were useful and interesting and fun for tea practitioners who hosted gatherings and wanted to put out an object that would excite the guests that represented part of a new trend or a new moment. Uh, and this wonderful piece uh, is a perfect example uh, of that uh, Oribe tradition, uh, which continues up to the present day in Japan and is part of the uh, kind of landscape of traditional ceramics that many potters in Japan still make today. You can find many Oribe serving dishes, uh, tea bowls, uh, and other ceramic objects in the department stores uh, and ceramic galleries uh, in Japan today. Um, these are some of the sources I used uh, preparing this, pre uh, this presentation. Uh, and I would love to hear from you with any questions or comments. Please feel free to email me uh, at mpatelka at unc.edu. Actually, uh, before I go, there's one final point uh, I'd like to make. Uh, the, the word oribe is associated with the name of a very significant figure in the history of Japan, uh, a, a warrior, uh, a, a warlord actually, a daimyo, uh, who was also an avid tea practitioner and uh, taught many others uh, in the field of tea and is recognized as a tea master uh, in the tradition of Sen no Rikyu, the, the um, perhaps most influential tea master in all of Japanese history. Furuta Oribe lived from uh, 1543-44 uh, until 1615, uh, when he died, essentially as a casualty of the uh, reunification efforts of the Tokugawa family and the Tokugawa shogunate, the, the new military government that ruled Japan until the 19th century. Um, Oribe was uh, an innovative tea practitioner and did seemingly experiment with new wares like the ceramics that I told you about that were coming out of Mino and Seto. And there is some evidence that he um, would on occasion use these new kind of radical objects in the gatherings that he himself hosted. Uh, however, the association of the distinctive uh, green glazed kind of abstractly uh, decorated uh, dishes and tea bowls made in Seto and Mino with the tea master Furuta Oribe is a later combination. It is not historically verifiable at the time of Oribe's life. 
uh, it seems to have been a kind of um, conflation of the radicalness of the, the man and the radicalness of the new ceramic style. Uh, it may have been intended originally when tea practitioners recorded that they used an Odibe tea bowl or, or an Odibe dish uh, in their tea diaries, which is an important part of how we know about the history of tea and ceramics in Japan. It may have been meanted, excuse me, it may have been meant to mean this is the kind of object Odibe would have liked. Um, this is a, a construction you see in tea diaries, especially around Senodiku. This is a Riku style tea bowl or a, uh, a tea bowl in the taste of Riku. And that's part of the imagination of later tea practitioners who are engaged in a culture of almost hero worship for the founders, uh, this, the, the, the men who lived at the time of the reunification of Japan, who served uh, Hideyoshi and Ieyasu and, and walked among, among giants in the kind of growing mytho history of the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Later tea practitioners liked, I think, as consumers to think that they were walking down the paths in aesthetic terms that these great men of the um, Momoyama era, as it's called, had walked down. And uh, it therefore is an anachronism. Uh, and it's an interesting one, and it's one that has its own distinctive story and history, but I think it is a mistake to associate a piece like the wonderful uh, dish uh, that we are seeing uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture with the man who was a real historical figure, Furuta Oribe. It shows us the way that our tendency to want to identify objects with individuals uh, and to unfortunately engage, I think, sometimes in uh, a bit of anachronistic thinking in which we assume that radical changes in art come about because of the, cha the, the decisions of individuals. I think, as a historian who works on material culture, that rather aesthetic change, especially innovation of the kind we see in the Seto and Mino kilns, is the product of whole communities collaborating with one another, engaged in back and forth, contesting, competing, uh, working with each other and against each other, often motivated by the desire for recognition, competition over funds. Uh, that produces innovation in the arts far more than, in my opinion, the, the brilliant flash of insight of one individual at one moment in time, at least in pre-modern Japan, uh, perhaps in most of the rest of the world throughout history as well. So that's my final little addendum here about why I didn't talk about Furuta Oribe, the warrior, and why I think our attention instead should be on the history of the relationship between Chinese ceramics and Japanese ceramics, uh, the changes in the culture of ceramics brought about by the popularity of tea, uh, and the incredible innovation that occur occurred in the uh, desires of tea consumers in Kyoto and Sakai, and their patronage of the kilns in the Seto and Mino region. Uh, that's the real interesting story here from my perspective. So thank you for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Take care.